My name is Jonathan Martinez. I am here today to tell you that you've all been lied to your whole life. From when you were children, to when you were students, to when you were employees, you were misled, done wrong. Because contrary to what you were told, there are stupid questions. <laughs> Here's one. What's your favorite right? I know, it sounds like a pickup line at an ACLU convention, but bear with me. What is the right that, in, in your mind, is the most important, that makes you the proudest to be a citizen, an American, a human being? Free speech? Community integration? Integrated employment? Coffee first thing in the morning? What do all those rights have in common? Choice. Choice, right? Free speech, the right to choose what to say. Integrated employment, the right to choose where to work. Community integration, the right to choose where to live. And if you're a heathen, you can drink decaf. <laughs> what if you weren't allowed to make choices? I know, it sounds so weird that you wouldn't be allowed to make choices. Jean-Paul Sartre said, I am my choices. Every single person here is here because of the choices you made. You are the sum total of your choices. Those choices that are good and bad, silly and significant, casual and critical, they make us. They chart our lives. They tell us what we can be, what we will be, what we can do and what we shouldn't do. So let me ask you again. How would you feel if someone was able to say, you can't work? You can't live where you want to live. You can't see who you want to see. Would we even be citizens? To quote Benjamin Franklin, to call me a citizen while taking away my rights as a citizen is like calling a gelding a stallion. I mean, thanks for the compliment, but I'd rather have what you took away. So I ask again, what would you do if someone tried to take away your fundamental right, your right to make choices? You'd be angry, wouldn't you? You'd take action, wouldn't you? Well, for 2,000 years, that's exactly what we've done to people with disabilities and older adults. We have taken away their right to make choices. We have taken away their opportunities to make choices. All those rights, those fundamental rights to make choices that are so important, gone through guardianship. See, guardianship is a legal process where a judge takes away your right to make choices and gives it to someone else all your rights to make choices, making you an unperson. Because someone else gets to be you, make decisions for you, make choices instead of you. You can't interact with society except through that person. Why? Lawyers in the room or people who've watched Law and Order, <laughs> tell me what happens when a judge thinks a person who is accused of a crime is not competent to stand trial. They order an evaluation, they order treatment. The state pays for treatment to help the person be restored to competency. Why? Because those rights to liberty and freedom are so important that we don't want to take away them from people if the people aren't able to help themselves. We pay for that, the state pays for that. We'll take away the criminal part. What do we do when we think people may not be able to make all the decisions in their lives. Well, for 2,000 years, it's been guardianship. Whether we call it putting the feeble-minded under curators like they did in ancient Rome, or putting idiots and lunatics under comites like they did in Middle Ages Britain, or just guardianship like we do today. What society has done consistently is said that if you lack the skills to do something, or if we think you can't do something, we're going to take away your right to do everything because we don't think you can do anything. And I do mean the right to do everything because study after study after study has said that the vast majority of guardianships are full or plenary guardianships where every single right the person has is given to someone else. Every right from where to live or where to work to whether they even get health care in the hands of someone else. Why? Well, I think it's because of this. Because for 2,000 years, guardianship has been viewed as a kindness. It's to protect people. 
We help people with guardianship. We keep them from making bad decisions because if someone didn't make decisions for them, they might make a bad decision. They might do something risky or dangerous. So we put a guardian over them to make decisions for them in their best interests and for their own good. Can I get a show of hands here? Who here has heard the phrase, relax, it's for your own good, and been terrified? <laughs> and that's what happens right before the shot, right? right. <laughs> So why do we do that? Why do we make those choices? Why do we take away the right to make choices through a guardianship? Especially when study after study after study has found for decades that people with disabilities who make more choices, who have more control over their life, who have more self-determination, have better lives. We've known that for decades. They are better employed, more community integrated, more independent, healthier, better able to recognize, resist, and avoid abuse. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on a webinar presenting the latest results of the National Core Indicators Survey. A little preview for you. The National Core Indicators Survey is a state-by-state -state survey across the country where states collect data about people with disabilities. They look at their their quality of life, the things that go into their lives. And one of the things they looked at this time was whether people with intellectual and developmental disabilities had guardians. And this is an apples to apples comparison. They looked at people with the same abilities, same types of limitations, and looked at whether they had guardians or whether they didn't have guardians and what their lives were like. Well, across the country, people who didn't have guardians were more likely to be employed more likely to live independently, more likely to have friends who weren't paid or family members, more likely to socialize in the community than those who have guardians. So let me ask you, if we know that the more self-determination you have, the better life you have, if we know that guardianship reduces self-determination, and if we know that apples to apples, people who don't have guardians across the country are more likely to be employed and integrated and independent than people who do have guardians, don't we have an obligation to at least try something else before guardianship? I'm not here to tell you that every guardianship is wrong or that if you seek guardianship over a loved one, you're evil. That's not my intent in being here, but my intent in being here is to say, we need to think about things first. We need to consider other options. Do this for me. Everyone here, think about 1995. Think about what things were like in 1995. Some of you here were in grade school. I hate you. <laughs> Everyone else, think about 1995. Think about what things were like, all right? Um, it was five years after the ADA. It was four years before the Olmstead decision, so it was still perfectly okay to warehouse people with disabilities in institutions. Segregated employment in sheltered workshops was still a valid employment outcome. The height of technology was listening to your disc man singing along with Mambo Number no. 5 <laughs> while waiting for the magic words, you've got mail. <coughs> now think about today. Think about what we have today. We have Medicaid waivers. Community integration is a right. Supported employment, community-based employment is the rule. We have iPads and smartphones and more supports and services to help more people be more independent than ever before. So can someone answer this stupid question? Why has the number of people under guardianship tripled since 1995? a million more people. We've lost a generation. And as the studies show, the vast majority of them have lost all of their rights. Why? And again, I tell you, it's because guardianship has been seen as a kindness. Day after day after day, teachers tell parents, when your child turns 18, you have to become guardian so you can have a say in their education. Doctors say, you've got to become a guardian so you have a voice in their medical care. Lawyers say, you've got to be a guardian to have control over the finances. Well, let me see a show of hands here. How many people here at the age of 18 were a finished product? <laughs> were ready to control their lives and make only good decisions? <laughs> 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 There's always one. 
<laughs> well, unlike you, uh, I had, a, I had a, a little visual aid planned for this part in my presentation. It was a photo of me at 18. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a fedora and suspenders, uh, unironically. <laughs> And, and there's a wine cooler in my hand. <laughs> I just couldn't. <laughs> I just couldn't. But the point is, when we're younger, we do stupid things. We make risky choices. We're supposed to. We're supposed to do risky things so we can learn what it means to do healthy things, so that we can become better, smarter, stronger, better functioning, productive adults unless you're a person with disabilities. Because only people with disabilities are held to the Mr. Spock standard. Yeah. We only look at people with disabilities and say, unless you make every logical decision, we're going to take away your right to make all the decisions. Why is that? Especially when we know that when you make more of your choices, you have a better life. So as I said, I'm not here to say all guardianships are wrong. I'm here to say think about it. Consider other options. One option. It's called supported decision making. Supported decision making is not something new. It's not some hippy trippy ideal. It's not some latest fad. In fact, as one friend of mine says, it's a fancy way of saying what we all do every day. But I know, you gotta put labels on jars. So here we go. Supported decision making is giving people with disabilities the information they need and want so they can make the best choices they can without the need for a guardian. <sighs> or as I call it, decision making. Because everyone here does it. Everyone here probably did it today. Everyone here does it every week. We all engage in supported decision making. We all get the information we need to make the best possible choices. Think about it. You go to the doctor. The doctor says you got a subluxation in your cervical brachial area that we can treat conservatively with rice and anti-inflammatories or we can treat aggressively with an intervention. And you say, huh? <laughs> and the doctor goes, you got an owie in your neck. <laughs> What's your preference, Motrin or surgery? And you say, I got it. Now I can make a decision. You've engaged in supported decision making, just like everyone else does, just like people with disabilities can. People with disabilities make decisions the same way everyone else does. Some people may need different types of supports or services. Some people might need more intensive discussion, but we all do it the same. There's one critical difference. When people without disabilities do it, you're smart, you're judicious, you're making well-informed decisions, you're getting second opinions, you're doing research, right? When people with disabilities say, I need a little help here, explain this to me, I don't understand, they're dumb. Society says you can't make decisions, so we're gonna have to put someone else over you to do that for you, all with the best of intentions, all for protection, and by the way, does anybody here really think that having a guardian is going to stop you from ever being in any danger? That putting a guardian on someone is like putting bubble wrap around them. They're never going to have any danger. They're never going to have an opportunity to make a bad choice. These are not the guardians of the galaxy, okay? <laughs> okay, bear with me on this. Okay, bear with me on this movie. I'm so glad I'm not the only one who saw the most popular movie next last year. Think about that movie. It's a big, giant talking tree, right? Groot. And Groot is able to say three words and three words only in the same order. Groot says, I am Groot, all the time. I am Groot. In the beginning of the movie, that's comic relief. Everyone makes fun of him. Uh, you know, say something different next time, and they laugh. But as you watch that movie, you realize Groot says, I am Groot, in different ways, at different times, with different emphasis. And the other characters realize it, too. And they begin to understand what he means when he says, I am Groot. Spoiler alert, Groot saves the day because he's part of that supported team. That's supported decision making. That's giving people what they need. That's understanding everyone's decision making voice. That's recognizing and respecting people's decision making potential. And if we do that, if we recognize people's decision making voice and their potential, then we can finally get to a place where people with disabilities have access to the same things we all have access to. When they have access to the benefits of self-determination, like increased employment, like increased independence, we can finally get there. But to do that, we have got to change the way we think. As a society, we have to say once and for all, 2,000 years of overprotection is too much. 
once and for all, people have the right to make choices. People have the same opportunities to exercise the same self-determination as everyone else. And you know, when I say that to families and doctors and lawyers and professionals and teachers, I always get the same response. I always go, you're asking us to change the way we've always done things. You know what I say? Yep. <laughs> yes, I am. I am because every great advance, whether in civil rights or anything else, has changed the way we've always done things. Everything that we've ever done, everything that has moved things forward, has changed basic assumptions and the basic way we've done things. And you know what? I know that's hard. I know change is hard. Choice is hard. Choice can lead to risky choices. Choice can lead to bad choices. People can get hurt. That's hard. But as one of my favorite writers, Stephen Donaldson, says, we were not promised ease. The purpose of life is not ease. The purpose of life is to choose and to act upon our choices. In that way, we are not judged on our outcomes, but on our resolve and our daring and our effort. Amen. We're not judged by how we fall down, but how we get up. We're not judged by our mistakes, but how we learn from them. We are judged on who we are and who we're going to be, the sum total of the choices we make. And when there comes a day when supported decision-making is implemented as a paradigm, not just <coughs> as an alternative to guardianship, but as a way to integrate people in society, because there's opportunities all around us. Special education IEP meetings, vocational rehabilitation IPE meetings, Medicaid waiver planning, all of these are opportunities for people with disabilities to make their own decisions with the support of family, friends, and professionals, the support of some of these people in this room. And maybe that's why just last month, the National Guardianship Association, a national organization that trains guardians, that has a code of ethics for guardians, they came out and said supported decision making should be tried before guardianship. So when that day comes, I pray it's coming, when supported decision making is the way we do things, when we recognize and respect everyone's right to make choices, well, that's going to be the day when we finally get past the stupid questions. When people with disabilities and those of us who are one accident, one diagnosis, one healthcare crisis away from being judged as having those limitations, all have the same opportunities to make the same choices, to make the same decisions, to reap the same benefits. And when that day comes, our favorite rights, whatever they are, will be equal rights. Thank you so much.